most of the forecasts that, that are out there, including the forecasts from your federal government, would expect that that oil demand in the U.S. would likely remain stable for many years to come. So we're, we're at the point where it is, uh, it is very apparent that the U.S. is going to need to continue to import oil for a number of decades, and really we're now down to the question of where do you want that oil to come from. Canada is already the largest uh, uh, importer of oil to the U.S. Um, and we are, we would expect the oil sands, uh, with growth of production from the oil sands, we have the ability to add significantly more imports to the U.S. So it's a question of energy security. Uh, if you take a look at the other countries that import oil to the U.S., uh, they are largely countries uh, that, that in many cases do not share the values of Americans, in, in certain cases are uh, actively against a lot of those values, and to suggest that those other countries are more responsible environmental citizens than Canada uh, really begs comprehension to me. Canada has proven itself to be a very good steward of the environment. We have uh, excellent, transparent environmental rules for the development of our resources, and I think when you get down to the point of where do you want to get your oil from, it is far more compelling to be getting your oil needs from Canada rather than getting it from other countries such as Libya, Nigeria, or Venezuela. So what's going to happen with this oil is it will be shipped to refineries in Texas. It will be refined into diesel, some gasoline, some jet fuel, and a large part, perhaps all, of that diesel, jet fuel, and gasoline will be exported to Europe and Latin America. The United States will bear the environmental risk. The United States will face higher <clears throat> oil prices. In fact, the State Department estimates that building this pipeline will increase in the official EIS, which Alex is otherwise going to defend. The official EIS says that America's export bill will go up 1.5%, $6 billion a year, if we build this pipeline, in any of its options. So this is really not what it's being presented as. This is not a way to give America more access to affordable, secure tar sands oil, albeit dirty. That's the story you hear. Yes, it's dirty, but you get these other benefits. We're not going to get these other benefits. The oil companies are going to make larger profits. That's who's going to benefit, because the oil is not going to stay in the United States to bring our prices down. They are very clear about the fact that they think prices in the Midwest for oil are too low. They don't like the fact that we're not right now paying OPEC prices for oil in the Midwest. We are on the coasts, because on the coasts, the oil that comes here is OPEC can manipulate its price. OPEC is not able to manipulate the price in the American Midwest, and that's what they're trying. Jason, Mark, you've been up, been up there and done some reporting. How does Alberta oil compare to other, other crude oil in terms of its carbon content and other... Uh, it's got a bigger carbon footprint. Um, if you just even take some of the most conservative figures, which come from Cambridge Energy Research Associates, they say that to get a barrel of oil from the Canadian tar sands to the retail pump is 30 to 70 percent more greenhouse gas intensive than the average barrel of oil consumed in the United States. Now, if you actually go what's called wells to wheels, the whole life cycle, it's still 5 to 15 percent more carbon intensive. Now, maybe 5 to 15 percent doesn't sound like a huge number, but at this point in time, I don't think we can afford any increase in greenhouse gas emissions or greenhouse gas intensity. Um, so to say that, and especially some of the, the new processes that are coming online, which is called in situ um, extraction, where they inject uh, you know, steam into the ground. That takes a lot of energy to do that. Canada is using one-fifth of all of its natural gas just to extract tar sands oil. You have to use a lot of energy to create some energy. And so the greenhouse gas intensity um, is, is much higher than the average barrel of oil. And I think that, to me, is one of the most compelling claims. I mean, I, I was really surprised. Um, you know, the U.S. State Department said that, that this pipeline will have no significant environmental impact. As a journalist, that felt to be like the classic example of the headline writer not actually reading the story. Because when you go into that report, you see that the State Department itself says that, um, according to a U.S. Department of Energy survey, uh, according to the U.S. Department of Energy numbers, 
uh, oil from the tar sands are 17% more greenhouse gas intensive. That's a significant environmental impact to spill all of this oil in the atmosphere, and I don't think we can afford it. Canada's moving towards clean energy in some ways. Uh, the price on carbon in Alberta and, and British Columbia moving away from coal, and yet your own environment ministry says that the oil sands will negate all of those benefits. Yeah, and, and in, I'm not sure about those projections exactly, but, but a couple of things that I think are really important. One of them is that the, the, there is, has been significant improvements in the carbon intensity per barrel in the oil sands. So one thing that I think happens sometimes is that we assume that the oil sands production is static when it comes to environmental performance. When since 1990 we've seen a 30% improvement in the carbon intensity per barrel. And we're going to see continued improvements on that front given the amount of investment that's going into technological technological studies to improve the energy inputs into producing a, a barrel of oil. But I do think that Canada, well one thing that's important to note is Canada and the US have the very same target at a national level for our GHG emissions. That was the target inscribed in Copenhagen of a 17% below 2005 in 2020. So we have, I think, a very shared environmental approach when it comes to GHG reduction. And we are very proud of the fact that just last week, we started the legal process to ensure the phase out of all coal-fired electricity in Canada. And depending on the projections and the report that you're, that you're re referencing, there's some different projections that are being made, but Canada has adopted a GHG reduction target that's exactly the same as the US. We are making significant progress when it comes to our electricity fleet and our Minister of Environment has announced that major emitters of GHG will be regulated. You know, we have been looking to align with the national approach in the United States when it comes to GHG reductions, and that still, I think, is the interest of the government of Canada, but our Minister of Environment has announced that there will be regulations on GHG emissions, and that will include the major emitters in the oil sands. There's a number of ways that uh, our opponents use to exaggerate the, the greenhouse gas intensity of the oil sands. Is number one is, is this issue of, of wells to wheels versus wells to refinery gate. It is a fact that anywhere between 80 and 90 percent of the greenhouse gas uh, related to a barrel of oil does not come from the production and refining of it. It comes through the combustion of the refined products uh, in the automobiles or at, at, out at the tailpipe. So right off the bat, we're talking about a fraction. Uh, we're arguing about a percentage of a fraction. Uh, CIRA in their most recent report identified one of, one of the errors they, they found when people looked at relative greenhouse gas is that they were comparing the greenhouse gas intensity of the average barrel of oil sands crude with a barrel of WTI. Well, WTI is a light, sweet oil, produces less greenhouse gas emissions. The problem is, is that WTI in no way, shape, or form represents the average barrel of refined pro or of oil that is consumed by refineries in the U.S. Uh, the refineries in the U.S. are increasingly using heavy oil in their refinery runs. That makes sense. Heavy oil is a lot cheaper than light, sweet oil, and light, sweet oils supplies worldwide are decreasing because it was the it was the highest quality it was the easiest to find we're seeing the slate of gas oil production across the globe moving increasingly to heavy so you know when you think about what happens if canadian oil no more canadian oil is allowed to get to to get to refineries in the u.s gulf coast those refineries spent tens of billions of dollars to configure themselves so that they could run these heavier crudes. These heavier crudes are cheaper. If Canadian oil does not get to them, they will source heavy crudes elsewhere in the globe and you will get the same emissions uh, uh, being produced worldwide. The other comment I would make is there is a big difference between assuming that by stopping Keystone XL, you're gonna stop the development of the oil sands. You heard Cassie talk about it. The oil sands really represent the engine of economic growth for Canada for at least the next five decades. If, if, if the U.S. market were to be closed off for incremental barrels of Canadian oil, 
it is not a fair assumption to assume that the people in the oil sands will stop developing that crude. They'll continue to develop and, and produce that crude. They'll do it reliably and they will do it conscientiously, but it will go to other markets. And you know, the, the globe and the, uh, the atmosphere does not respect borders. Demand is the problem. It's all of our cars that create the demand for this stuff. We're the problem. So the reality is that the world cannot long term, there's enough conventional crude. If we burn all the conventional crude that there is in the world, we would fry the planet. If we burn all the conventional crude plus a lot of unconventional crude, we doubly fry the planet. We really can't afford to become dependent on this much oil. You're right, the issue is demand. But it is not necessarily the case that the only way to change course is just to go after demand. We're going after demand, Canada's going after demand. I think this is a bad project from a bad industry from a fundamentally good country. I want to be clear, I want to be to Canada. <laughs> We're not so great. But what we discovered was once you build these facilities, once you build this infrastructure for an oil-dependent economy, it's much more expensive to move off of an oil-dependent economy. Tar sands oil basically doesn't make economic sense unless the price of oil is north of $80 a barrel. The world cannot afford to continue to produce huge volumes and consume huge volumes of $80 a barrel of oil. That will make Alberta rich. It'll make Saudi Arabia rich. It'll make North Dakota rich. It'll make Alaska rich. It'll make Venezuela and Kuwait rich but it will impoverish the rest of the world. We need to be putting the dollars that are currently going in to developing the tar sand. In the Canada needs to be developing an economy that is not dependent for the next five decades on the growth of the tar sands industry, because if the tar sands industry goes for the next five years, Canada's permafrost will all melt. We cannot afford in the United States to have Canada give us another fix and this is another fix for our addiction to oil. And we cannot afford to become the transit pipeline for continuing to feed oil to Europe and Latin America. The world needs to get off oil. Wait, Alex, I just simply don't understand this argument that, well, if we don't take it, someone else is going to take it, so therefore we should take it. I mean, that's not the question on the table. The question is really, is the United States going to be complicit in burning megatons more of carbon dioxide that is going to, start, that is going to fuel runaway climate change? I mean, if, if the Chinese want to jump off the atmospheric version of the Golden Gate Bridge, that doesn't mean we have to jump off the bridge as well. I mean, I just don't get it. This is what the, the choice here facing Americans, Alex, is fundamentally, do we want to be consuming more oil? And I agree with you. I don't want to get, you know, lost in the weeds on a conversation about the fractions of a percent. The question really, as Carl said, is do we continue to make investments that leave us on the path of a carbon-intensive economy? Or when do we start to make the decisions? When do we make the hard decision that say, we are going to stop using oil? Or we're going to decrease our dependence on oil? And this is one of those litmus tests. This is one of those places where we draw a line in the sand and we say, we have to start someplace. And the place to start is by saying no to the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, because otherwise, we just, we just keep postponing the future. Oh, we'll eventually get around to decrease our dependence on oil. This is a place where we say, no, we're going to make a U-turn and start pursuing a clean energy economy. You know, the U.S. is going to consume oil at some level, which will probably require imports for a very, very long time. The U.S. can choose to deprive themselves of this source of oil, but the oil is going to be, it is going to be developed, as, as I said before, and I think there are a lot of easier targets if people really want to make a meaningful impact on reducing greenhouse gas consumption in, in the U.S. Our coal footprint is enormous, it is criminal, it is toxic, it is coming down. But it is very interesting when we debate the coal issue with Peabody Coal, they make exactly the same argument that you make. They say, if you don't use our coal here in the United States, those people over in China or <laughs> India are going to burn it. That's the argument they use to rebut our effort to get American investment dollars and American focus on clean energy substitutes. Keystone XL is making exactly the same argument. If you don't take it, it'll go somewhere else. If we don't give it to you, you'll take it from somewhere else. 
the argument we're making is we don't need it. We can get off oil. There are actually lots of things that are cheaper as a way of transporting than oil at $80 a barrel. Oil at $80 a barrel is not a market, and that's what tar sands oil has to cost at volume. We need to move this country, and I would hope that Canada would move itself, but I'm not a Canadian, so that's ultimately up to you. We need to say the fossil fuel era was the 20th century, it's over, and we're going to invest in the future. And the, we cannot afford for tar sands oil to be the future. I think one of the, 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 the really great things about Keystone is that this is a pipeline. It, overall, it's a 13, combined with all the phases, it's a $13 billion project that is going to put tens of thousands of Americans to work. But the beauty of it is, is that it is being financed 100% with cap capital from the private sector. The communities around the oil sands have received significant economic benefits from its development in, in employment, in funding going into companies. For instance, Aboriginal companies in the oil sands have received billions of dollars of contracts have gone into those communities around the oil sands. So, I mean, like any kind of boom, this is a major energy play, the largest in North America, you're going to get concerns around kind of an overheating of the economy. But the economic benefits for both Canada and the United States of the oil sands development can't be underestimated. It is a major economic driver. And many First Nations feel that the, the tar sands development is systematically shredding the rights that they've been guaranteed under treaties with the Canadian government. And so, you know, the, there are some commentators in Canada that like to set up this dichotomy between supposedly ethical oil from Canada and conflict oil from other countries. I mean, the fact is there's no such thing as fair trade gasoline. Um, conflict and strife follow oil, you know, like, like white on rice. I don't know, this is part of the package. And you see that conflict in the First Nations communities that are really torn apart, where yes, some people have these companies that are doing very well, and it is an entry of the economy. And at the same time, many people there feel and see that their traditional cultures and the ecosystems on which they've always depended are, are really being destroyed. You've got one at least one First Nation, the Beaver Lake Cree, who filed a lawsuit against both the Canadian federal government and the government of Alberta, saying that their treaty rights have been violated by the, the tar sands development there. Now, that's going to slog its way to the Canadian courts for quite a while, but if the Canadian Supreme Court were to find that, in fact, this development has, has violated their First Nation rights, um, it's going to be very hard to say that this is ethical oil, or that this is somehow somehow better than other places. I, I agree with Carl that yes, um, the people, the First Nations, the Aboriginal peoples of Canada have more rights than say the Ogoni people in the Niger Delta, or than say women in Saudi Arabia. But I don't know that that's a, a, a really um, much of a consolation, that distinction is much of a consolation. If you're a First Nations people, if you're the Beaver Lake Cree, and you're seeing your homeland being destroyed, you're being told, well, you can either work on our minds, you can take a government handout, or you can starve. I mean, that's just not very fair. The government of Canada, and that's where I come from, we know and we respect the fiduciary responsibilities we have to consult with First Nations on any major project. And through that consultation, there has been a significant number of accommodations, as they are called, with economic benefits. And those are negotiated with First Nations. So I, I just want to make sure that there, there isn't a, an a, sort of a perception that somehow the rights of Aboriginal people are being ignored. They are being carefully, carefully consulted, and a lot of the, these contracts and employment benefits have been negotiated as part of these projects. They have received, they are per capita doing better than almost Aboriginal groups in any other part of our country. And still I think within those Aboriginal communities, yep. there's a lot of ambivalence, and there's a lot of heartache over, mm -hmm. boy, you know, what, what we hear from everybody is, do you bite the hand that feeds you? Everybody recognizes that they are completely dependent now on the tar sand industry for jobs and for economy. And at the same time, they feel really torn over the systematic destruction through the clear cutting, through the strip mining, through the institute mining that's happening in their traditional homelands. The, the U.S., and we've been involved for over three years in this permitting process for Keystone, and there has been an extraordinary amount of work and effort put into assessing, quantifying, and reporting on the environmental impact of this project, but every day millions of barrels of oil show up on the shores of the U.S. in super tankers, and no one cares. 
what the uh, carbon content. If, if it comes by pipeline, then there's a big concern about it, but the vast majority of oil being imported into the U.S. has, no one is looking at the carbon, and as long as it shows up at the dock, it's, uh, it's acceptable. Jason, Mark, quizzically, and then we're going to go to our first audience I mean, the, the question really gets back to the, the millions of barrels that show up at U.S. shores every day. And I would really direct folks to check out a February 2009 study commissioned by TransCanada and prepared by an energy firm called Pervin and Gertz. And if you look on page 7, figure 3 of that, and I posted that this morning on our website at earthislandjournal.org, if you look at that, this pipeline will not decrease imports from outside North America. They will remain and they project out to 2025. Again, what this pipeline will do is fill in some of the gap from declining heavy crude reserves in the US and Mexico, and perhaps maybe a little bit from Venezuela. But we will be getting just as much oil from Saudi Arabia and the Middle East with this pipeline as without it. And so this idea of energy security or, or fuels from other countries, I just don't think it holds up. You know, you look at Nebraska. Nebraska already has 20,000 miles of pipeline across that state, many, many miles of which already go through the pipeline. They produce 6,000 barrels of oil a day through the aquifer. We are comfortable with our state-of-the-art pipeline that we're going to be very uh, safe in that area. Well, let me, I was asked to respond, so I just quickly say, uh, I am sure that BP was comfortable they could produce Macondo safely. I'm sure that Tokyo Electric was confident that their power plants would survive the earthquake and the tsunami. The fact is, there are some situations in which, yes, you may have a very long track record of something catastrophic not happening. But when something catastrophic happens, you can't undo it. And the question is, which is being raised particularly in the state of Nebraska and particularly in the context of the routing of this pipeline, to a particularly sandy an area of the state, which is viewed by people there as being particularly at risk, why shouldn't we adopt yet another layer of safety and reconfigure the routing of this pipeline? Because whatever reassurances and confidence TransCanada may have, they have had pipeline spills. Every pipeline operator has pipeline spills, most of which don't end up being catastrophic. But one of these days, one of them will, the bigger the pipeline and the more vital the water source, the higher the risk of a catastrophe. Um, yes, next question, please. Hi, my name is Rose Brads, and I'm with the Center for Biological Diversity. And I think any discussion of the Keystone XL pipeline needs to really start with and recognize that as of today, more than 600 people have been arrested in front of the White House. And these are people, climate scientists, farmers, uh, climate activists, communities of faith people from all across the country, all ages, and that because they're doing exactly what Jason was talking about, is putting that line in the sand, saying no more expansion of this oil infrastructure, and um, really calling on President Obama, who has this within his power, you know, this is not a congressional discussion, this is not something that needs to happen in international negotiations. We um, are saying this is a line in the sand, this is the moment, when we, long overdue moment, when we need to say no more to this, the, the carbon, our carbon addiction, and this is a moment that's going to happen because the people really are standing and, um, and and being arrested as we speak right now. So thank you. Who wants to? I mean, Cassie, go ahead. Can I just say that I think that whether or not the Keystone Pipeline is built does it will not have any impact on the amount of carbon that the United States, as a as a country, uses. So I think there has been an unfair targeting because as we mentioned, there still are tankers coming in, you know, bringing millions and millions of barrels of oil into the United States on a tanker, which is a much less safe way to, to transport oil. So I just think that the targeting of this particular project. But at least if the United States imports oil sand, which has a higher carbon intensity, than the alternative fuel, it will drive up the... But, 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 sorry, but wait a second. That's assuming that the U.S. is, if it doesn't import Canadian oil, it's going to import light, sweet oil from elsewhere. The fact of the matter is, if Keystone doesn't go ahead, those refineries, unless prevented to, from doing so, are going to be sourcing heavy crude, which has identical greenhouse gas emissions characteristics as, as oil sends oil from Alberta. And that's assuming also, I mean, this is a real assumption here, again, is that U.S. oil demand is going to remain constant or go up. And that's actually not, from 2000 to 2009, 
U.S. oil, again, according to the Cambridge Energy Research Associates, which is one of the, the most respected and conservative energy firms, um, says that between 2000 and 2009, U.S. oil consumption decreased 10 percent. Two reasons. One was the recession was the most obvious one, and the second one was increasing fuel economy of our cars and trucks, which is actually going to get better and better according to new rules announced by the Obama administration and agreed to by all the folks that are having Bill Ford and GM, etc. We're actually looking at either a plateau, or if we make the right political decisions, a decrease in oil demand. The reason why the energy oil companies in Alberta are so eager for this pipeline is because they've got this massive supply of stuff. This is really, I think, supply side economics. They need to get this stuff to market. Or, in the words of, I think it was the energy minister in Alberta, they're going to be sitting on landlocked bitumen tar. You know, they're going to be sitting on this massive resource that they're going to have a hard time getting to market. That's why this pipeline is important. And, I, and again, I don't, I don't buy the China argument. This is really a discussion about what are the choices we're going to make. And at some point, we need to make the choice that we're not going to be making investments in all of this new infrastructure that locks us into business as usual. We have already reached the earliest of the tipping points. Uh, the weather you experience for the rest of your life will have been influenced by the increase in greenhouse pollutants in the atmosphere. Uh, there are more severe tipping points coming. Uh, we don't know precisely what the level of damage is at a specific atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide and methane. But we know that we certainly cannot have confidence that we are not getting close to what most people would consider catastrophic tipping points. And it is clear that the longer we continue to believe that, oh, we're running out of sweet food, but there's all this heavy stuff gunk in the ground, and we'll just use that, that's not sending us the right message. One of the important things about stopping the coal-fired power plants that were going to be built in the United States was it sent America's public utilities a message, get serious about renewables. If we stop the Keystone XL pipeline, it will send America's industries a message, get serious about getting off oil. This will not displace any barrels of Saudi Arabian oil. Don't take my word for it. Look at the TransCanada investor reports. This is about making up for the expected shortfalls in American and Mexican and perhaps Venezuelan heavy crude. Those refineries down there are especially equipped, as Alex was saying, are especially equipped to process heavy oil. They've got cokers and they can actually take all this stuff. This, the, the Saudi oil is what we call sweet light crude. It's, those refineries are worried about having shortfalls in the heavy crude that they've been processing for years. This is about making up for shortfalls in U.S. and Mexican decline reserves. And I would say we shouldn't make up those shortfalls. We should find ways to have a, you know, electrified mass transit system that runs off a green grid um, and be doing that instead of finding, you know, alternatives. We're, the, the oil industry is not going to get us off of oil. Let's go to Cassie Jordan. We have, uh, we, we have a very strong case. This is a project, you know, as I said, uh, it, is, it is truly shovel ready. We're going to put 20,000 Americans to work. We're going to start doing that within days of receiving this permit. And we're going to create $20 billion of stimulus for the American economy. And that's going to occur in, in, in regions that are among the most depressed in the U.S. And those jobs are coming without a penny of government subsidy. And they're waiting on this approval.